Hi guys. So we went through a few things in the last lecture. We developed the idea of um, trim and stiffness where we're looking for the moments to be zero. So we introduced the moments associated with aircraft axes, so L, M and N in uppercase. And we then introduced the uh, non-dimensional coefficients for each of those, along with the aircraft convention for roll pitch and yaw. So we've got the moments L, M, N, we've got the angular rates P, Q and R, and we've got the angular uh, displacements, which are phi, theta and psi. We then also spoke about the two aerodynamic angles, the angle of attack, which is nose up, and the angle of side slip, which is nose port. So we developed these ideas of stiffnesses, gave the conditions for the two stiffnesses, which is Cm alpha has to be less than zero, and Cm beta has got to be greater than zero. But both of these occur if we have the center of gravity ahead of the aerodynamic center of the aircraft, both in terms of vertical and horizontal center of um, aerodynamic center. So we've shown that and we showed the conditions for stability, um, but we're going to now make a model very specifically for our aircraft in pitch. And we're looking to numerically determine the conditions that give us longitudinal static stability. So let's call this, let's say longitudinal Longitudinal static stability, often called LSS. This is looking at pitch stiffness. So what we're trying to find out is what gives us CM alpha less than zero. Remember, that's our condition. And how are we going to get it? So looking at our aircraft, the things that uh, are going to matter, we're going to do a, take a side on view of our aircraft. We care about where the center of gravity is because that's the point about which the aircraft will turn. We care about the aerodynamic center of the main wing and the aerodynamic center of the horizontal tail. And then the distances between those we care about. We also care about the elevator and its deflection angle, and then the angle of incidence of the horizontal tail. So we're gonna formulate a diagram that includes all of these, and we'll start labeling it as we go along. So we have our main wing. I've drawn a nice cambered main wing. We are going to draw a cambered tail as well. Cambered tail with an elevator. Let's draw that at a bit more of an angle, actually. Let's draw this up here. Cambered tail with an elevator on it. So this is my aircraft longitudinal axis. Let's call this long axis. And then, so I've got my main wing, I've got my horizontal tail, and I'm going to now draw my center of gravity on here. So we can draw some forces on. I'm gonna treat my aerodynamic center of my main wing as being the quarter cord. So this is the lift produced by my wing. And I'm gonna put on here as well, the lift produced by my tail. And we're gonna draw our Angle of attack here, alpha, so this is V infinity. Now you may note that I draw my lift normal to the longitudinal axis and not the flight and not the um, incident velocity. So I'm making a small angle assumption inherent in this model. I can draw the aircraft weight here as well. Let's draw some angular quantities on. So the tail is mounted at some angle from the longitudinal axis, IT. In fact, let's draw all of our angles in blue just for consistency. So we've got IT, alpha, uh, let's rub it out and, and redraw it. So alpha, which is the angle of attack, the main wing. Um, I've got my elevator, which is deflected by some angle. So this is delta E here. Um, what else do we need to draw on here? Let's draw, so the main wing is has got bound circulation, which means that there is a tendency for the velocity to have this sort of motion around the main wing, which induces an upwash ahead of it and a downwash behind it. So there's the downwash here, and we call that downwash. Let's just give this the symbol WI. 
So we have here, we've got the infinity at this angle alpha. So we've then got a reduction in effective incidence occurring here. So this is V prime, which is the effective velocity going into the tail. And this angle in here, we call epsilon. This is the downwash angle. Such that the angle of attack at the tail is equal to the tailplane incidence plus the angle of attack at the main wing minus that downwash angle epsilon. So we've got those there. Uh, let's draw some displacements on as well. So I'm going to draw some uh, reference points. We're going to take distances from something called the forward moment reference point. Now I have drawn this on as the leading edge of the wing. Could be the nose of the aircraft, could just be an arbitrary position on the aircraft that I've chosen. So this distance here is the mean aerodynamic chord, C bar. The distance between the wing aerodynamic center and the forward moments reference point is H naught C bar. So H naught is a non-dimensional distance. Um, and then the distance between the forward moment reference point, what's going on here? Um, distance between the forward moment reference point. This appears to have frozen, one second. My iPad's frozen, let's uh, go back. There we go. Okay, so the distance now between the forward moment reference point and the center of gravity is H C bar. Remember H is this non-dimensional distance and then we multiply it by the mean aerodynamic chord to get this distance. So we then also want to draw some other distances. Let's say the distance between the center of gravity and the quarter chord of the tail. Let's say this is L subscript T or LT. And then we're gonna say the distance between the two aerodynamic centers is L bar T. Let's just move this. Do I need to draw anything else on this? I think that's pretty good, actually. That's a good diagram now. So we have on here, we've got the lift produced by the main wing, the lift produced by the horizontal tail, and these are both being put at their respective aerodynamic centers. So because they're at the aerodynamic centers, we need to include our zero lift moment, and we put M naught um, about the aerodynamic center of the main wing, and this is taken to include the zero lift moment of both the wing and the horizontal tail. So this is our diagram and we're gonna use this to help us look at moments around the aircraft in different places. So this term here, L bar T, you tend not to see this one put in too many textbooks. People tend to work at LT because they collect moments around the center of gravity. Now, I prefer to collect moments about the aerodynamic center of the main wing just because it enables us to work in terms of total aircraft lift rather than separating out the wing and the tail. I'll show you both methods and then we'll go forward with looking at the aerodynamic center, which is the one that I like. So let's collect moments. I'm gonna make this small so hopefully we can still just about see that. So let's say, collecting moments at the aerodynamic center we get the sum of moments at the aerodynamic center where we have the zero lift offset there 
And then the weight is acting downwards, so it's producing a nose up moment. So it's the weight multiplied by the moment arm, which is H minus H naught C bar. And then we've got the tail lift is producing a nose down moment, so that's going to be negative. So that will be L T multiplied by L bar T. Now, the reason I like to do the moments of the aerodynamic center is because we can use the equilibrium steady flight condition to get that the lift is equal to the weight. So this becomes M naught plus L H minus H naught C bar minus LT multiplied by L bar T. Okay, so we remember from our definition of the pitching moment coefficient, CM is equal to M divided by half rho V squared S C bar. So we can then just do the moment about the aerodynamic center. So we'll say CM AC is equal to Siri, I don't want you to do anything. Nope. Moment about the aerodynamic center is CM naught, so that's just the zero lift pitching moment. Plus, now if I do L, if I divide it by half row V squared SC, I'm going to have CL divided by C bar, and I've got another C bar here, so that helps me out. So I've got CL multiplied by H minus H naught. And then Let's do this properly. Let's say I've got L T multiplied by L T bar divided by a half rho V squared S C bar. So you might think, and you'd be forgiven for thinking that this here would give you C L T. Okay, that would be the lift coefficient of the horizontal tail. But the lift coefficient of the horizontal tail is defined as the lift at the tail divided by a half rho. Sorry, you'd be, you'd be forgiven for thinking it would equal, uh, let me just take that off and say that you'd be forgiven for thinking that that was equal to it uh, because the C is obviously not in there. So then we need ST here. Okay, so ST is the area of the horizontal tail, which is gonna be much smaller than the main wing. So to turn it from a lift coefficient into the lift produced by the horizontal tail, we need to use the actual area of the tail. So we need to, we can rearrange this and we can, um, and in fact, there's one more thing I should have put in here actually, I should have put here, it's not the same as V. We are going to use V t squared. And this is a quantity we haven't spoken about, but if we take this out, I've got half rho v t squared. We can think about this as being q t, which is the dynamic pressure at the tail or the total head at the tail. So if we have our aircraft that's flying along, main wing, vertical tail, terrible aerodynamic design here. So if we can imagine the flow is going along and it hits the wing, the wing causes a lot of drag, the rest of the fuselage causes a lot of drag. And what it means is that if we've got Q here, which is the dynamic pressure at the wing, we've got QT here, QT will be less than Q. So we define something called the tail efficiency factor, eta t, which is equal to the tail dynamic pressure divided by the dynamic pressure of the free stream. So we can put all of this together and we can make the substitution in here. We get cm naught plus cl h minus h naught minus clt multiplied by eta t. And then we've got st on s w, so just s, multiplied by lt bar, divided by c bar. Okay, so remember the tail efficiency factor in here, and then we've got this 
bunch of stuff here. So let's have a look at what we have. This bunch of stuff, there's some great English, Harry. So this is, and we're going to give it a name, we're going to call it the modified tail volume coefficient. Call it VH bar, okay? H for horizontal is equal to ST LT bar divided by S divided by C bar. And what we can think of this as being, this, is, this gives us a measure of how effective a tail is at producing a pitching moment because it gets bigger if you have a bigger size tail, it gets bigger if your tail is further away from your main wing. It gets smaller if your wing is larger, so your, your wing is like, or it gets smaller effectively if your tail is small compared to your wing. And then, and then the C bar, it gets smaller with a larger chord size of your main wing. So this is, I call it the modified tail volume coefficient. It's because there is something called a tail volume coefficient, which is just VH, ST, LT on S, C bar. So just remember that LT bar is wing AC to tail AC. LT is CG to tail AC. Okay, so effectively um, exactly the same sort of measure, but it's just it's just what that distance is is going to change slightly. Okay, so we've now got our expression that helps us determine the total moment around the aerodynamic center. We could do the exact same thing looking at the moments about the center of gravity. If we'd taken moments about the aircraft center of gravity, we would have got CM around CG is equal to the same thing, CM naught plus now it would be the wing lift rather than the tail lift, H naught, H minus H naught minus CL E to T, and then we'd use the tail volume parameter, not the modified tail volume parameter. Uh, I've called it coefficient, the coefficient parameter, you see both in the uh, in the literature quite a bit. Okay, so we've now got two expressions that enable us to determine the amount of lift the tail must produce. And this is there just effectively to balance the zero lift pitching moment of the wing um, and the relationship between the wing and the center of gravity. So we could rearrange both of these for the quantity that we need. There should be a T in there, which is CLT. Okay, so we could rearrange both of these for CLT. CLT, CM naught plus total aircraft lift coefficient minus H minus H naught divided by E to T and the modified tail volume parameter. Same thing as CM naught plus CLW, H minus H naught, E to T, VH. Okay, so Let's just have a look at these quantities. So the quantity that we've got in both of these is H minus H naught. So H minus H naught is a dimensionless representation of how far the aerodynamic center is ahead of the CG.
Okay, so it makes sense that the, we can see here that the amount of lift the tail must produce is proportional to that quantity. But in reality, it's actually the other way around. This is really more useful. So in reality, we end up saying more often that the maximum amount of lift that a tail can produce or the tail lift ranges are going to dictate the allowable positions of CG. Okay, so we've got these two models for longitudinal, or the we started to produce these two models for pitch stability. Um, we've got this CLT in there, this tail lift. Now we can't proceed any further until we've got an idea about this tail lift and how it changes. So we're going to introduce a model for tail lift. So we know the tail lift has to be a function of the angle of incidence of the tail and the elevated deflection. So we'll say that CLT is equal to alpha T, which is the angle of attack of the tail, multiplied by the lift curve slope of the tail, which we're going to call AT plus the elevated deflection multiplied by the rate of change of lift with the elevated deflection. So let's see what these are. So alpha t we already know, i t plus angle of attack of the aircraft minus the downwash, a t dclt on d alpha or of the alpha t we should say. This is the lift curve slope of the tail. This is the elevator deflection. Now I did in my diagram, this was positive tra trailing edge down. No good convention for control surface deflections. It depends on which airframe manufacturer you're looking at. Sometimes which side of the aircraft you're at. Um, so just pay attention to this when you are developing this and using it in the future. You've got to just check what the sign convention is that you're supposed to be using um, and it might change depending on which aircraft you're looking at. This one here is the rate of change of the tail lift with elevated deflection. Okay, so it makes sense as the elevator gets more deflected down, we've got an increase. Okay, so according to my sign convention, this would be a positive number. If the sign convention was the other way up, in which that it was a deflection uh, trailing edge up, then we would expect this to be a negative number. So let's substitute those into here. So CLT is equal to AT IT plus alpha. I didn't catch that. Could you try? Because I wasn't speaking to you. Okay, so plus alpha minus epsilon plus alpha E, delta E. So this downwash angle here, let's think about where this comes from. So if we have our aircraft longitudinal axis, we've got main wing, which I've drawn with sweep, and we've got our horizontal tail here. So this is a very simple aircraft model. We using the vortex theory of lift could represent this as a single horseshoe vortex. So we've got bound vortex 
and then we'd have these trailing vortices here. I'm trying to draw these consistently, but it's hard. So the downwash that we get here, which we called WI from, I think, um, is going to be proportional to the downwash angle that we're going to get. So the downwash angle rather is going to be proportional to that angle. Um, I put more detail on the notes about how we could come up with a model for this. Um, but fundamentally, we can see that it will be a function of the angle of attack. So if we've got the angle of attack here, uh, then if this increases, this increases, which means this increases, which means this increases, which means this increases. So it makes sense that there is a representation of epsilon that's just a function of alpha. So we can say that uh, epsilon for our purposes is just going to be equal to um, d epsilon on d alpha multiplied by alpha. We'll say epsilon subscript alpha, alpha, because that's just the notation we've been using for these partial derivatives. So this is now at it plus alpha one minus epsilon alpha. Okay, so we can substitute this all back into, we can substitute this CLT into our expressions before to get two different expressions for the pitching moment coefficient. Okay, so starting at the aerodynamic center first, CMAC is equal to CM0, which is the zero left pitching moment, plus CLH minus H0, nothing's changed yet. We're then gonna put this dirty great expression in there, which is alpha T, IT plus alpha, one minus epsilon alpha, plus AE delta E, multiplied by e to t vh bar. I mean, the notes I go through and I repeat this for the center of gravity and I encourage you to do it yourself, but I'm just gonna work through with the, um, with the center, with the one at the aerodynamic center. Um, there's a bit more detail in the notes on this as well. I might include a potential calculation of this angle because in reality, this is going to be a function of all sorts of things like the sweep of the main wing. Um, it's going to be a function of the displacement between the two, both in terms of LT bar, but then also if this was displaced um, vertically, it would be a function of that. It would also actually really be a function of the span-wise distance across the horizontal tail. Um, there's loads of models of varying complexity you can use, and there's also the fact that actually it would take time for any changes to occur. So if you had a sudden increase in lift, then it would take time for that lift to, or that circulation to be trailed into the wake. There would also be some shed circulation occurring. So this would also then be a function of time. It's sort of getting beyond this course, but I want you just to be aware that we've got these nice simple models um, I'll talk about them in the in the notes a bit more, but they are sort of simple models that help us understand things, but they are just a, a sort of an abstraction of what we're looking at. But if we take our models that we've got now, we take this idea, which is CMAC. Um, and, you know, what? why is this useful? So let's think about what we've got. We've got the moment about the aerodynamic center is equal to the zero lift moment plus the any moment due to the aircraft weight which is then therefore equal to the lift coefficients, plus a whole bunch of stuff to do with the tail. So what's gonna help us in this expression is setting this equal to zero, because if we set this equal to zero, we've then got a trim state. And if we do that, we can then solve for the elevator angle. And this is gonna help us determine the elevator angle that gives us a trim for whatever conditions we care about.
when it's solved for the elevator angle and you'll end up sharing like delta E and I am just copying this rather than doing the rearrange rearrangements. Because I'd rather talk about this equation than do a whole bunch of algebra right now. Okay, so to get from here to here, and I encourage you to do that rearrangement on your own, you're going to need one bit that's probably going to help you. You'll need to know that CL is equal to CL naught plus um, alpha multiplied by A. Okay, so this is going to help us because in this equation at the top, we've got an alpha term in here. So alpha is equal to CL plus CL naught divided by A. Okay, so if you make that substitution, then yeah, you get the you get the difference there. Okay, so this is the zero um, incidence lift. Okay, so I encourage you to try and do that rearrangement yourself just to check you can see where these equations go and how they work. But now we've got this, we can just check that um, it makes sense. So, okay, so looking at this expression, we can see some things that uh, you know make sense to us. So the elevator deflection is proportional to minus CL. Okay, so um, effectively, as CL gets bigger, the elevator deflection gets more negative. So for a big CL, then the elevator deflection needs to be trailing edge up, and that makes sense because. For a big CL, the aircraft's got to be pitched up, so alpha has to be higher. And in order for alpha to get higher, the moment has to be nose up. This is this has got to push down. So to make the tail push the aircraft down, there's got to be an increase in the elevator trailing edge up. So that makes sense. And we can see here because of the two minus signs, the elevator deflection is proportional to h minus h naught. So this is just the distance between. the CG and the wing aerodynamic sensor. So that makes sense again that the if the CG is far away from the wing aerodynamic sensor, then the wing is producing a large pitching moment around the aerodynamic center of gravity, so around the center of gravity, then the tail has to produce a larger moment to restore it around there. And hopefully, obviously, we can see that the elevator deflection is a function of the zero lift moment, which is a const part of the constant. Um, it's a function of, it's an inverse function of DCLT on D alpha T, which is what we want to see, um, of the tail efficiency and of the modified tail volume parameter. And then in here, we see that it's going to be an inverse function of the tail incidence. Um, and then these other aerodynamic terms that we're not really too interested in these terms on the right hand side at the moment. Okay, so we've got that here, the elevator angle to trim. Um, we use this quite often to work out what is going to be the zero angle, uh, sorry, or how can we make the elevator angle zero? So So we'd like the elevator deflection angle at trim to be zero. 
um, whenever we're at the cruise speed. So at the cruise speed, uh, we've got a certain CL that will be, for example, if we are in a propeller-driven aircraft, we're gonna cruise at our minimum drag speed. Um, then we would choose the CL associated with that, whatever the alpha we'd have to be at, we would like to have zero elevated deflection. And the reason for that is the elevated deflection increases the parasite drag on the aircraft. So if the tailplane incidence or combination of the tailplane incidence and the tail volume parameter can be adjusted to give that to be zero, then we can have a more efficient cruise in our aircraft. So we've also spoken about different lift curve slopes for the aircraft, so let's just talk about them a little bit again. So we've got the main wing, which is, produces LW, and then we've got the tail producing LT. Now, overall aircraft produces L, which is equal to LW, plus LT. And now, as engineers, we work in coefficients. Now, you might be forgiven, or you won't be forgiven, you might be not alone if you think that the CL for the entire aircraft is CLW plus CLT. But that's not true, okay? So we can write down the entire coefficient by saying CL is equal, just remembering that they've got different numerators, that CL for the entire aircraft is equal to CLW plus E to T, S on, sorry, S, T on S, multiplied by C, L, T. Okay, so that then does effectively the rearrangement for the different denominator. Um, and we can then also just use our tail lift model in here now to give C, L, W plus E to T, S, T on S. And then our tail lift model is gonna be uh, the, let me think now, it's the tail lift curve slope multiplied by it plus alpha, one minus epsilon alpha um, uh, plus, plus a e delta e, okay? So that's our total aircraft lift as a function of the, just now, the wing lift, some parameters that are gonna be a function of the aircraft shape effectively, um, tail lift curve slope, tail incidence, again, aircraft angle of attack, and then the rate of change of the downwash with the aircraft angle of attack, and then the parameters pertaining to the eleva elevator. We can then differentiate this with respect to the angle of attack to get the total aircraft lift curve slope. So A, this is the aircraft lift curve slope, is equal to D, CL, on D alpha. So it's going to equal A W, because this is going to be D C L W on D alpha is simply equal to A W. Um, plus E to T. So these terms on the right are going to disappear. I T is going to disappear. We're only going to be left with the alpha term here. And then it's just going to be reduced to one minus epsilon alpha. Okay, so now this is our expression for the total total lift curve slope of the aircraft. Okay, just because we might need that a little bit later in some equations that we look at for the total aircraft. So we've produced this model and we've used it to help us determine the trim of the aircraft. So we've got, if it loads up, this expression here is, will give us the elevator angle that will give us a certain trim state. But we haven't actually been able to use it for what we said we would yet, which is determining stability. So remember we want CM alpha to be less than zero. So we're gonna look for the what's called the stick fixed static stability. Stick fixed static stability just means pilot ain't doing anything. So 
So the pilot in its input is constant. So if they move the stick to a position, keep it there and they don't do anything else, okay? So what we'd like to do is take, and remember our condition that we want, we already have the condition, which is CM alpha is less than zero. So we can take our expression for CM around the, around the aircraft central gravity, and we can then differentiate that with respect to alpha and get the condition for stability. So let's do that. DCM AC on D alpha is going to be, let's find our expression for CM alpha. I can't remember where this is now. Let's copy this. I'm going to paste that there. I'll probably get rid of it once I've done the differentiation. Okay, so let's just that's going to disappear. Um, this is going to become a function of alpha, which we've got, and then we've got alpha in various terms in here. So let's say dcm on d alpha is equal to cm alpha, which is equal to the total aircraft lift curve slope multiplied by h minus h naught minus now what do we have in here we've got only this bit okay and it's important that we chose the stick fixed static stability because this then d delta e on d alpha is equal to zero whereas if we if we were thinking about how is the aircraft if the aircraft had a flight control system that always trimmed it then we'd have to include a function in here but we don't thankfully so we've got e to t VH bar, and then I've got one minus epsilon alpha, and I've got AT, yes. Let me just check that's right. I've got a slightly different format in my no, we're good. We're good. No, we're good. I'm good. <laughs> okay. So this is our condition for stability. Stick fixed stability. Um, we're working CM alpha because that's what we said for our, st our stability derivative. It is more common for aircraft to work in DCM by DCL. I think it's common because it's easier because it gets rid of a lot of um, lift curve slopes from the expression and the sign of, well, we'll say that the sign DCM on DCL is equal to the sign DCM on D alpha. So that's going to help us here. Okay. And the relationship between the two is, is easy to determine as well. We've simply got that DCM on D CL is equal to D CM on D alpha multiplied by D alpha on D CL. So that's D CM on D alpha divided by A. So we're going to just take this whole expression up here divided by A and that gives us the lift curve. It gives us the rate of change of the pitching moment with the rate of change with the lift. So hence, okay, so that is our expression for DCM on D alpha. So DCM on DCL. Now let's just have a look at it. So because it's, it's effectively got the same sign 
um, it's just multiplied by a constant as our stability parameter, it means that the same conditions occur here. So if this is if DCM on D alpha is positive, then we're unstable. If it's zero, then we're neutral. And if it's negative, then we're stable. So we've got our conditions now on this expression for stability. So let me just move these actually over there. There's no way of easily moving blocks, I don't think, in this. Let me just see if I can do that actually. That would have been smarter, just moving it rather than copying it and moving it. Um, so we've got this expression here. So we can see that there's going to be some point on here, effectively, well, first let's look at all of the things that we've got here. I'm rambling now, sorry guys, I'm just getting a little tired. I've been lecturing for hours. Um, so our stability is going to be a function of this here, which is the distance between the air wing aerodynamic center and the center of gravity, and then some constants about the tail. So this is going to, we, well, hopefully we can see here that if we go right back to our diagram, just remember what those h and h naught are. If I can remember which lecture I did the diagram in. Here we go. Okay, so H naught is the position of the wing aerodynamic center and H is the, again, the non-dimensional position of the center of gravity. So if we've got a, an aircraft of existing design, then this is set and it's this one that we can adjust. So it makes sense that there is some position of H, which is the bit that we can adjust. It's gonna give us neutral stability So H is just this longitudinal CG position. It follows. There is some location that gives neutral stability. So we define this as the neutral point. It's defined with the symbol HN. Okay, so we can just get that by setting this whole equation equal to zero, rearranging for H and calling it HN. And so we can write that down fairly simply. We get HN is equal to H naught plus modified tail volume parameter, tail efficiency, AT on A. I messed up here guys, sorry, this should have had a divided by A there because I did this substitution, I forgot to bring that in there. And then I've got one minus epsilon alpha here. So our neutral point Remember the neutral point now is the furthest aft the CG can be before instability occurs. So if you're ahead of the CG, if the CG is ahead of the neutral point, your aircraft has positive pitch stability. If the aircraft's behind, the aircraft's got negative pitch stability, which is not good. Okay. Or it's it's I should say I should say it's stable or unstable, because using positive and negative is, is confusing because of the sign conventions in these. So we'll say if the CG is ahead of the neutral point, we have 
a stable aircraft. If the CG is behind the neutral point, then we have an unstable aircraft. So for our aircraft, it's a function of the wing AC and then a bunch of things corresponding to the horizontal tail. So if we imagine an aircraft that doesn't have a horizontal tail, then our, our neutral point is simply the wing aerodynamic center. Then we put a horizontal tail on the aircraft and the distance gets larger. So what we can see by this is that the horizontal tail pulls back the neutral point from the wing CP position. And if you are astute, you might have noticed, or you might realize, this is very, very close to the definition of the aerodynamic center itself. So if with the CG being at the, if the CG is at the neutral point, then that is very close to the definition of the actual aerodynamic center because then the actual pitching moment is no longer a function of alpha at that, at that position, okay? So, We've now got this idea of the neutral point and what it and gives us a, a better indication of what the tail does by doing this, pulling the neutral point after the main wing CP. Um, now that we've got this, we can then define, we can sort of quantify the amount of stability. So we know that if the CG is at the neutral point, then uh, we are neutrally stable. If the CG is ahead of the neutral point, then the aircraft is stable. And if the CG is behind, then it's ne it's not stable, it's unstable. So we can use those to define a numerical stability expression. And this is called the static margin. And the static margin is simply it's uppercase HN, it's the CG position minus, oh sorry, it's the neutral point minus H. Okay, so it's the distance between wherever the CG is and the neutral point. So if you are behind the CG, then you've got, uh, sorry, if the CG is aft of the neutral point, then HN is negative. If the CG is ahead of the neutral point, then it's positive. Okay, we can also just look at the definition of the neutral point. We've got this here and we've got a definition of HN from the previous. HN is defined here. If we take this expression for HN and subtract, um, subtract H from it, then what we end up with is HN is equal to H naught minus H and then we've got the rest of the things were in the expression, which is e to t, vh bar, at on a, one minus epsilon alpha. So this expression here is exactly the same expression as this multiplied by minus one. So, Here we go. So we can see that the static margin is the negative idea of this pitch stiffness. Sorry, it's not the it's not the negative pitch stiffness because because we need this to be negative. H 
HN is the pitch stiffness. Now I confused myself a little bit with this earlier and I don't want to confuse you guys. Okay, so we've got this um, effectively here, then we can talk about the pitch, we can talk about the stability being either stable or unstable. Um, then I don't want to get confused about talking about positive and negative stability. So we'll not, we'll not talk about that in this case. Okay. So the distance, the actual CG is for or aft of the static margin is this idea, which is the, is, is sorry, sorry, for or aft of the neutral point is this static margin. So it dictates the pitch stiffness. So it gives us this, and it's also then going to tell us how difficult the aircraft is to maneuver. Okay, so I've got just enough time to get this next bit done. You can probably tell I'm flagging a little bit. I've recorded about three lectures in a row, so I'm a little bit tired, um, but we'll get this done because I really want to get stability finished and done. So if we've got this idea of neutral points, then we can use this to investigate the elevator gradient because it's going to be related to, well, I said here that tells us how difficult the aircraft is to pitch up and down. So if we take our previous expression for the rate of change of the, or we'll take our previous expression for the elevator deflection angle, which is, he, where is it? Here. If we take the elevator deflection angle, um, and if we, this is the elevator angle deflection angle for trim, and differentiate it with respect to the lift coefficient, we're just gonna have terms in here. So if we do that, and this is one of those awful things that's left for an exercise to the reader, then what we get is, let's say, taking elevator angle to trim and diff with respect to CL, we get D delta E on DCL is equal to minus one over AE VH bar eta T, AT on A, one minus epsilon alpha eta T VH bar minus H minus H naught. So that's just taking, like I say, it's taking this expression and we can see here that if we differentiate this, we're just gonna have the negative sign from the CL. Um, CL will disappear and we're just left with this term multiplied by this term here. So what we've got here, this is the rate of change of the elevator deflection angle with respect to the lift coefficient. And again, this bit in here, it's just our static margin. So that's minus one over AE h bar eta t h n okay so an aircraft that has a large distance between the center of gravity and the and the neutral point so the center of gravity is quite far ahead of the neutral point you're gonna to have to deflect your elevator a whole lot more to affect a CL change, which means to affect a speed change. So one last useful bit is how on earth do we validate this idea of neutral points? So you've probably got a good idea about where the neutral point is on a given aircraft from these simple models and then from some more complex models involving full sort of wing, probably still just potential simulations, you'd have a good idea of where the center of gravity um, can sit on an aircraft. So it, in order for certification purposes, it's important to find out and prove that's where the where the neutral point is. But we can't fly with the, with the center of gravity at the neutral point because that's obviously dangerous. 
So flight test verification of the neutral point is, is performed. But it's performed without flying with the CG at the neutral point. Okay, that would be H is equal to HM or the static margin is equal to zero because that would be bloody dangerous. You'd have neutral stability and it's not possible. So the way that it's performed is by flying a series of flights with the CG still ahead of the neutral point, but at different longitudinal positions. We're still well ahead of the neutral point. And then what would be recorded, they'd record how the aircraft trims at different speeds. So different speeds correspond to different CLs. They would then look at what's the elevator deflection angle to get certain lift coefficients. They'd say, well, um, different Vs, therefore CLs, what's elevator deflection angle to trim. So how do we hold this speed by adjusting the elevator? They take those data for a series of flights. Let's say we've got on the horizontal axis, let's plot CL and let's plot delta E. So say we've got um, CG aft somewhere, again, still ahead of the neutral point. So we'll say this is aft, then CG somewhere further forward. and then CG even further forward. So they'd then be working out what's the elevated flexion angle for those different speeds. Then we can see that it's just a nice linear function or linear-ish probably for most aircraft. And then once we get these gradients, what we've got here is you could determine D, delta E, and DCL. And then once we've got those, we could then plot that versus the longitudinal position of the center of gravity. So take these, I'm gonna put my forward CG. So these are all negative slopes, forward CG, medium CG, our CG and we then plot a straight line through it. So let's just say this is long CG position. Plot a straight line through these and wherever it crosses the X axis, this would be verification of the neutral point because that's the linear extension working out where there would be a sign change in DE by DCL corresponding to the theoretical behavior of this curve, which would be a straight line on this graph. And obviously if there was flight performed at with the CG aft and somehow the aircraft was maintained controllability, then the line would look positive on here, but we don't ever want to fly in that case. So gone through quite a lot there. Um, this has gone through trim, uh, and this idea of stability, we know this idea now of longitudinal static stability for our aircraft is that DCM by D alpha has to be negative. And we've shown that in order to do that, the aircraft center of gravity has got to be ahead of the neutral point. So the neutral point is this location that without the horizontal tail would just be the aerodynamic center of the main wing. But the horizontal tail pulls this neutral point aft and we call the neutral point lowercase hm. So then we've got this measure of stability, which is how far the CG is ahead of HN, and we call that uppercase HN, which is our static margin. 
So our static margin is the pitch stiffness of the aircraft. So if we've got the CG well far forward, we've got a very uh, we've got an aircraft that's very stiff and it's very hard to move away from our trim states. So that's longitudinal static stability covered um, in two more in-depth lectures than I did in the shitty three lectures I did. Um, I'm going to cover cross coupling and looking a little bit at roll yaw coupling and power plant considerations in the next lecture. I hope you guys have enjoyed that. Give me any questions on Slack um, and I look forward to seeing you guys on Wednesday.